A computer mouse is simply a tool used to move a cursor around a video display. It doesn't necessarily need to be an arrow-shaped pointer. All it needs to be is just a simple block of ASCII text if it's so desired. The mouse is one such input device that we take for granted today. Every computer on the planet has support for a mouse in one way or another. Every operating system on the planet expects you to have some sort of cursor input device, and the mouse is pretty much the standard. Touchscreens have started to replace that in tablet and thin devices, but the mouse is still a mouse. It has been relatively unchanged for over half a century now. But there are applications where a mouse, or at least the type of wired mouse, makes absolutely no sense at all. An example I have here is the PowerBook Duo. At one time, this was Apple's thinnest laptop, and it has a ball instead of a mouse because, well, it's all integrated into the computer here. Trackballs have one limitation, however, is that you cannot make laptops thinner than the physical ball itself. So other solutions had to be made to try and figure out exactly what you were going to do to make a thinner laptop and a thinner computer, but you don't want to have an external mouse, and you don't want to use a trackball either. Uh, solutions for this had been developed many decades earlier, but during my research for this video, I ran into a little bit of an issue, which did actually come back to the power books. If you ask it what the first trackpad device was, it'll give you an incorrect answer. This here is an example of a relatively modern laptop, so it has the trackpad living right there. What is the oldest laptop that you can remember that has a trackpad in it? Don't Google this. I see. Well, if you go and Google what was the first trackpad, you're going to be erroneously given information that it was the Cirque Glide Point that was available in 1994. This is an example of that. This is the serial port version. It is an external device. It's just a little tiny pad gray rectangular box on it. You have two buttons here. I'm pretty sure they're just doubled up here as well. Plug this in, shows up like a mouse. Same thing like you had with the mouse, but rather than moving a large ma mouse around a large open surface, you can just use your finger. And you don't have to actually move the pad around. You can just leave it in one spot while you're working on a keyboard in a relatively cramped location. This wasn't the revolution to have this on your desk and eliminate the mouse. No, obviously the solution here is that because they could get smaller and they could get thinner, like for example, this Apple desktop bus version, it could be used in laptops. And Apple released a model of PowerBook in 1994, which was the first to be using glide point technology. And Google, for some reason, attaches itself to that and says, this is obviously the first commercially selling and commercially available trackpad that you could get for a computer. The reality is I can dispute that quite aggressively. I have another laptop that's just sitting over here. This is the DEC PC 320SX. Um, it says the Digital Equipment Corporation on the top of it. This is clearly an Olivetti design. I would not be surprised if it's just a rebadged Olivetti. When we open this one up here, yes, it is a laptop that's new enough. It still has like the factory like stickers here peel before use. Unfortunately, capacitors and battery damage have claimed this laptop quite early on. If I peel that off, I get a giant square rectangular pad and two buttons. And it even says right here, use only your fingers and the attached mouse pen. This is a laptop that I can find from the marketing documentation, dates it to 1991. I'm pretty sure in reality this was available for the 1992 market year. But that immediately throws out the whole Cirque glide point being the first commercially available trackpads. And if this wasn't enough here as well, I can find that Scion also had touch and trackpad-like devices at the end of the 1980s, and at the beginning of the 1980s, in 1982, a company by the name of Apollo had the DN100. This workstation system had an option which went to the right of the keyboard, which was, you guessed it, a trackpad. What does it do? You use your fingers to move a cursor around the screen. It's as simple as that. However, once we get beyond that point in 1982 and go 1981, 1980, and into the 70s, things start to get really confusing.
Rolling into the 1970s, without the momentum of the graphical user interface that you would find in systems such as the Macintosh or the Lisa, the use of the mouse becomes very in-development niche products that didn't yet really make a whole hell of a lot of sense to consumers. Don't worry, we're going to get to the Xerox Alto. This all is going to make sense in the end. I did, however, find in the 1970s companies that were experimenting with um, touchpad or like little tiny tablet digitizer inputs. I don't know if I can really call them touchpads because they weren't expecting you to use your finger on the surface to write or draw. Many of the examples that I can find were being used in Far East, e.g. Japan and China, for character input. A keyboard can only be so big, and Japan has famously released some massive kanji keyboards which are completely impractical to use because there's thousands of characters. So instead what would be available is a word processing system in some form of another, all of which were probably horrifically expensive, where you would have a digitizing pen or device and you could simply write the character on it and it would be able to recognize it. I, I can't find much more information beyond that, unfortunately. I can't find demonstrations of it running. I think there's like a few limited photos that came off of like Hitachi's and Casio's websites at some point in the past. There's small photos. There's very little details about these systems that I can find online. But ultimately, we do roll back to 1972 with the Xerox Alto and their mouse. Their mouse and the Alto was a product of the Palo Alto Research Center in Palo Alto, California. The Alto was never a shipping product commercially. Let's make that clear. It was designed specifically for academics and research purposes. While they did make a large number of machines, and these days they do seem to float around in auctions and private collections, and there's even some pretty good restoration videos on them, Ultimately, it was never designed to go beyond, say, like a private individual's home for testing purposes, and then it would go back. But at all times, it was using the mouse with the exception of a touchscreen that was apparently developed briefly. Al Casos mentioned this one to me, and he doesn't have photographs of it anymore, but I trust Al enough that a touchscreen on an Alto seems to make sense. But the Alto had a primitive form of a graphical user interface. Development times change, and so do products, and by the end of the 1970s, Xerox had entered into the business computer market. Now, many of these were CPM systems that were basic text input, but there's one system in particular that really perked my interest even from a young age, and once I saw the Xerox also, I had a hypothesis. It was wrong, but I had a hypothesis. On the low end of Xerox information systems, you would have the memory writer, basically a smart electronic typewriter that could remember vocabularies and it could remember like special words, do phrasing, formatting, and all that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it was just a very fancy typewriter. Uh, I have a later version of that. Tech Tangents also has a later version of the memory writer itself as well. But on the high end, Xerox had a Cadillac machine. And then I can tell it came out in 1979 or 1980, and it was the Model 860 Information Processing System. The photographs of this thing here, when you compare it to the Alto, are quite stunning. You know what it almost looks like? A streamlined, commercialized, refined and polished version of the Xerox Alto. You no longer have the large, heavy cabinet which was full of power supplies and cards and cabling. And you don't have on top of it the two and a half megabyte Diablo removable disc pack drive. Instead, we have a much smaller cabinet, still has a card cage in it, let's keep that in mind. But we have two eight inch floppy disk drives, and obviously we have a ton of space inside that we're going to have for a hard disk drive. So we can replace that two and a half megabyte with a five megabyte or an eight megabyte or something like that. Uh, more space than the Alto ever needed. And it's true. Um, a version of the Bravo word processing system ran on the 860. But the grim fact is that even though it has the portrait display, we don't have a mouse with this. This is not an Alto related system at all. The 860 is simply the most glorified, most overpowered word processing system that Xerox ever made. And my goodness, it was expensive. 
Uh, it was incredibly expensive. Not a lot of people bought them, apparently, in the United States, but according to other sources from the Digibarn, in Canada they sold peculiarly, particularly well, and yet I have never seen one myself. Later versions did have expansions that allowed it to talk to Xerox's later GUI office computing product, the Star, and there is another option that was available that gave it basic communications. I'm assuming like a terminal emulator or something like that. Again, there's not much information about it. But ultimately, I'm beating around the bush here for the 860. What's so special about this? Well, there was an option that was available for the keyboard. And it seems these days the only thing that still survives of these machines is the keyboard. Where's the Xerox Lebowski? And some of these models were optional with a circular pad that sat on the right side of the keyboard. That is not a mouse. <laughs> no, remember how I was saying before, you could have a mouse on a desktop and you could totally use it. But I'm willing to bet you money, even though I have no evidence to prove this. Someone at Park designed this product and they couldn't find any system that Xerox was marketing at the time that it made practical sense to use it in. The Alto was old news by this point here, and the Star was still very much in development and wasn't going to be commercially successful anyways. But the 860 came along, and he was like, ooh, 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 can I put it in there? Can I put it in there? And so it was available as an option. And if we call this the mouse, Xerox called this the cat. The cat checks all the boxes that I would expect in a trackpad-like device. And that I can find it's the oldest device that acts exactly like a trackpad with no extra strings attached or requiring, well, a pointing device on a string. Uh, it is a circular pad with a plastic piece that just kind of covers over a set of four electrodes. Is it capacitive? More than likely, is it resistive? It is not because again, the back side of this plastic and the other side of this plastic has no resistance or metallized surface to it at all. But ultimately the idea was behind this is that you just needed to move the cursor somewhere else on the 860s screen. Let's say you were in the lower corner and you want to move to the top. Well, that was simple enough. You just simply dragged your finger, and as it went across these domains here, it translates that into X, Y coordinates and moves a cursor, there's another prerequisite I was looking for, across the screen to wherever you wanted to go. Now, if you got a model of the 860 that didn't have the cat installed on it, all of the functionality was completely replicated on the keyboard. So this is totally an optional device that didn't need to be there, and yet it was there. Uh, I actually had to pop this one open and take off four captive plastic screws, but if we flip this over here, it's just four 555s, five, 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 some capacitors, diodes, and resistors, and these two adjustments here which control your X and Y. And I think you can see this. Let me zoom in here a little bit more. Now, I can't really zoom in much more here, but you can actually see Y up, Y down, X right, X left. And these two adjustments here are just simply to tweak and center the X and Y adjustments for calibration purposes. It has this cable right here, which then transmits that raw data to the cursor interface board. The cursor interface board would sit inside of the 860's keyboard and sits in line with the data path, or data path that goes to it. So on this side here, I believe it goes into the cursor interface from the computer and then it exits the cursor interface and runs off to the keyboard. A lot of that I can find over here is just decoding logic for the keyboard and on this side here these four chips like and resistors and diodes this is all the decoding logic for XY for the cat itself. It's a very simple device. I can find no information about this online besides one or two paragraphs in the 860's manual, which just basically says exactly what I've told you there. Um, I can find no patents. I can find no examples of prior art or use of this. And what I find really interesting is that after the 860, I can find no instances of this ever being used again. Part of this makes me believe that this is just 
Xerox in the 1970s and I guess into the 1980s being really clumsy with amazing products that Park and, well, Xerox corporate had designed and had no idea what to do with. So this is where it ended up. But as a result of being in such a niche product and like never really used anywhere else, nobody remembers it. Now, normally at this point in the video, I do like to go and pull out the equipment that this is attached to, and then I'll explain the hardware in detail, the software, we'll boot it up, and I'd show you how the word processing system worked with the cat attached and everything running. But like I mentioned before, I've only ever seen one other Xerox 860, and it was in a museum. It seems that all the units that were in Canada have long since been recycled, or they're still hiding away in storage. Or it could very well be like what we got here with the cursor interface and the cat, Someone got the keyboard, stripped out the parts they didn't need, and sold them on eBay. And some poor schmuck, like me, paid $90 Canadian for this. Oh well. Um, what I see this ad is, as is an artifact. I cannot find anything that fits the criteria that I laid out. Um, when it comes to what was the first commercially available trackpad, the Cirque Glide Point from the 90s? No, not really. It is a patented product, and chronologically speaking, it was mass-produced and used by major vendors. But in terms of actual shipping commercial products, even if Xerox only used it in one machine they had, the CAT is still the oldest one I can find from 1980, with development going into 1979 and even into 1978. I really hope you like this video here. If I ever am able to borrow an 860 from someone, sure, we'll do a demonstration. We'll try and figure it out. A word processor is a word processor. And, well, okay, we have my wheel writer, which has the diskette option. I've done a video on that. As I've mentioned before, I think I linked to it once already here. Tech Tangents did a video on his Xerox memory writer. I actually sent him the disks for that one there so he could get his working as well. But that's all I got for word processing, and that's all I have in this video here for the Xerox Cat. And until next time, have a good one.